That was Garden. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, okay. Now no, do, no, do Karma. Uh. <laughs> That's Ash. Oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Visual K podcast. I'm your host, Frederick, also known as Whirling Black, and with me today I have... You got your co-host, Alexi. And I'm your podcast producer and editor, James, also known as Plant. Okay, so guys, how do you feel about the last episode we did? It seems to be doing quite well on YouTube. I think we deserve a pat on the back. It was probably the best podcast episode in the history of podcasts i think <laughs> it was the sure. best. I mean, that's why it's making numbers you know? <laughs> <laughs> it was the best podcast episode in the history of visual k podcast perhaps that's fair <laughs> yeah uh, you can't that's, deny uh, that. I, I would, yeah you know it's funny that we're only like three episodes steve but i've already reached the stage where i really want to redo the first two <laughs> <laughs> yeah me too oh because I think it's just kind of inevitable that we will look back on the previous episodes uh, and think that we could have done them better. And I mean, it's kind of nice that way. I, I would hate it to feel like, you know, oh, episode one, that's that's where it's at. It's never going to get better than that. Like bands, <laughs> they peak on their first demo tape? Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm I'm kind of glad that we feel like we have some kind of progression going forward. <laughs> Oh, for sure. And much like today's band, we can just start releasing re-recordings of the old podcast with the new ones. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone will complain that they're worse than the originals. <laughs> yeah. On that note, the topic of today's episode is uh, Deer and Grey, and uh, especially their early stuff. We're focusing on the years 97 and 98, so their indies period, basically. They had a very short indies period. And it will start a long-standing During Grey series where we will go through the entire career up to the present day. Yes, not in a consecutive order, though. We're not going to like make a 10-episode marathon on During Grey, but we, it will come and go as we, as we feel fit. Yeah, basically, we'll kind of like see how do people like it and what other ideas we got and what's topical. And yeah, just return to it when we feel like it. Yeah, and uh, also at the end of the pod, we're going to give our impressions on the new Dear and Grey single, which dropped today, actually. Well, well, at the date of recording. Yeah, yeah, at the, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, at the date of recording, it dropped today, sorry. Um, before we begin the discussion on the early discography of Dear and Grey, here comes a short band introduction as well for those of you who aren't familiar with their early history. Deer and Grey was formed on the 2nd of February of 97 by vocalist Kyo, guitarist Kaoru and Dai, bassist Toshia and drummer Shinya. All of the members except Toshia had previously been part of the popular indie group Placedis, which featured Kisaki of later Phantasmagoria fame on bass. Later the same month they also recorded their first and only demo tape, which featured the tracks Karma and Aoi Tsuki was then distributed to record labels and studio insiders. On the 31st of March, they played their first live performance as a secret guest on the Vasala tour Genocide Zone, and on the 31st of May, they had their official live debut. Their first official release, the mini-album Missa, was released in July, and extensive touring followed. In December of 97, the band put out their first VHS, a special edition of Kaede If Trans, featuring music videos for several of their early tracks. It was later given a wider release in 98. In May of 98, the band released their first single, Jealous, and then later in August their second and final indie single, Isle. 
both being produced by Desire vocalist Yukia. The singles did well on the Oricon charts and received a lot of attention despite being independently released, and they were instrumental in getting the band their major label deal. In October they released two VHS tapes simultaneously, one featuring live clips from their career thus far, and one with music videos for tracks from their two singles, as well as a new one for the old song Karma. On the 2nd of November 98, the band played their last Indies live at the Nippon Budokan, thus ending their short run as an independent band and starting their major label career which lasts to this day. <laughs> So before we start uh, discussing the early Deer and Grey releases, I think it would be smart to talk for a bit about what happened before that so we get some context. And uh, Alexei, would you like to start us on that? Yeah, I think before we get to the Sadies, we could talk about how Visual K was like in 1995. So basically, you already got a ton of bands going major. Uh, bands like X, Lunacy were already like well established. So you had like a real scene. Unlike, you know, previous episodes when all the bands were basically like in the offing of the Visual K uh, movement, in a sense. Now you have like indie-rific compilation CDs coming out from like the windows and the chimney. So this is really the era when like Visual K as a scene and sound is pretty much firmly established. So in a way, like um, Lacedes comes into something that's like completely there. Yeah, it's very interesting that I, they are able to, uh, unlike the bands one generation earlier, which sort of had to invent the style and sound, Lacedes were able to sort of come into an already constructed scene and borrow tropes from already what was published. Yeah, and I think Lacedes were almost like a part of the last classic Nagoya K sound generation. You can hear Fanatic Crisis, you can hear Kuroyuma's first album, but you kind of catch all these musicians that are like a very rudimentary young developmental stage. So it's like their best impression of that sound. Yeah, I feel like it's sort of a time before they started branching off and trying to incorporate own sounds into the music as much. Like, for example, even in early Deer and Grey, even though it's also quite rooted in the 90s VK, you can hear that they're trying to incorporate some own stuff and borrow other things, while Los 80s were more sort of like, more of a just building on what was already there and trying to do their best version of what already existed. Yeah, and absolutely. Uh, probably the biggest difference to Deer and Grey is the fact that Kisaki is most likely the main songwriter, he's the leader of the band, but he's probably the songwriter as well, because you see similarities between this project and what he would do in the future. Yeah, and he has a very specific way of playing the bass as well, so oh, you absolutely. can definitely recognize him compared to Toshia from Deer and Grey. You can definitely feel like he's sort of playing the, pl playing the lead almost in the band. No, definitely. And um, on some songs, you can even sort of hear like a prelude to how bands on Matina would sound. Um, especially one that I would like to mention is uh, Furan Yueni, reminds me of like Madeth Grail. Yeah, and that's a very good reason for that, because Hisui from Madeth Grail was a roadie for Las Edis during their whole career, I believe. Or we're going to put on our tinfoil hats and we're going to say that Kisaki was Mades' ghost rider. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure if I would dare to go that far, but it's it's certainly a possibility. I mean, I, I suspect a lot of label CEOs wrote ghost, were ghostwriting songs for some of their bands, considering how many bands they had and how similar a lot of them sounded. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, think of Key Party, for example, where... 
at one point like all the bands were like a super high level and then suddenly like, just every band drops off yeah into an abyss from which none of them will recover yeah so about uh, also the los sadies i think that it's very very important to mention that they were around for only a year but they still managed to build a very like solid fan base they had a so during gray when they started already had quite a large backing for an indie band like it's not many indie bands that can, could go straight into releasing a, a a ep that's released so well as misa was yeah and there's also video footage of their concerts on youtube and there is like uh, i would say a bigger audience than most bands today get oh definitely and and yeah and even though they only lasted a year they still had a quite big impact in the scene but i mean i think it was kind of inevitable that the band broke up because you can already notice that they had very different agendas on what they wanted to achieve with uh, their musicality i feel like the deer and gray guys were very adamant on going major as a goal while kisaki wasn't having any of that because he wanted all the creative control yeah isn't that basically like the main rumor about this one i don't know if it's confirmed but Oh, yeah, I mean, the old main rumor was that, uh, you know, Kisaki stole Kyo's girlfriend or something. Oh, like that's that. right. That's a classic one. Fuck yeah. Yeah. But that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, like, uh, did you read the J Rock and Roll interview of Kisaki? Uh, I did not. I, okay. I read some select p- pieces of it. Yeah. What pertains to the interest of this episode is, first mm. of all, that he blames all the disbandments on his own personality, which is oh. very sad. I mean, but, yeah, but also probably true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, probably. Like, he, I think he said something like his ego, basically. But yeah, yeah. not only that, but he also like uh, they asked like, "What do you think is your like biggest achievement?" And he was like, "You know, being in Los Angeles." And I was like, "Oh, <laughs> it's so yeah. sad." <laughs> well, wasn't there something about meeting Q as well, or something like that? I don't know, but uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we'd love you, Kisaki, if you weren't cancelled. <laughs> yeah, let's not get into the reasons for that. I don't. Uh, I don't think that's uh, appropriate. This is a for PG the podcast. rated podcast. <laughs> uh, I I don't think it is considering the swears. I mean, Americans that's are true. quite it's all strict. Me, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Americans are quite strict about swears. I think even just saying like shit or something gets you an R rating, probably. No. So, uh, I mean, so the point is that Los Angeles had a kind of like fast career they lasted a year had a big following and then broke up and dear and gray formed like almost immediately on disbandment i think Los Angeles had their last live on the 14th of january and dear and gray formed already in february so that's like a month or less after the disbandment so i feel like toshia was just waiting in the bushes behind the venue he was ready. already sneaking into her dms <laughs> yeah, if such a thing existed in 97. <laughs> he sent them a snail mail. Uh, you put a note in the cassette that you're trading. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I kind of get why they joined up, though, because one thing I want to say about Daring Gray is that even though that they're a very skilled and very good band, obviously I would say that because it's my favorite band, but I feel like the synergy between the members are greater than the parts. Like, I wouldn't call any member except Kyo maybe like a super standout musician, at, certainly at this point, but I feel like they have a very good chemistry and that's why these early things are so good. So yeah, like you could see that they were sort of like just jumping at it straight out of the gate like the first demo tape was recorded already in february according to what i read on a reputable source run by selentau i assume (laughs) and it was recorded in one take supposedly with uh, the tracks uh, karma and aoitsuki and distributed to labels and they did their first lives around that time as well in march yeah karma isn't terribly different from something like Setsudan from Norowareta, Raku and Okage. So they're still sort of in this like afterburn of Lucedes in a way, which is understandable because I think Kyo was one of the main personalities in that band and especially his like Kuroyume Kyoharu fandom probably is the defining feature of early Deer and Grey in general, if you were to pick up any like specific influence. Yeah, and also I, I 
I can kind of see what you mean there. Like, Karma is a very Los esque song. It's very straightforward and kind of punky in a sense. I think it's just kind of early Nagoya style, really. Yeah, it's almost like almost like a death mask attempt except not really but it has that same kind of style yeah, of riffing it could be early like demo tape era fanatic crisis merry go around laputa all those guys yeah and it's also a very short track as well but i i do believe that also you can sort of see already in the last uh los Aires single like luciel already had them sort of branching out a bit or trying their hands at something more epic. I, uh, I think Kisaki also kind of built off of that as well. Yeah, going forward, Kis- Kisaki really loved his long long ballads. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, the Kar- from the Karma demo tape, there was only like a few months until they uh, did the release of Misa. So I think uh, we should move on to the... M- the, f- the first real Deer and Grey release, which is the Misa EP. <laughs> So uh, the first track is uh, obviously Kirito Mayu. Uh, how do you guys feel about that? Well, this is the purest Nagoya track in the bunch, I think. Shinya is banging the drums like a caveman. The guitar is sawing a tree. Uh, <laughs> the vocal is all up in it. Uh, phrases are dissolving into frantic screams. He has that sort of early VK goth tenor. Yeah, this is sort of the last appearance of Lacedes to me personally. Yeah, I like what you said about the drums and the guitar. And something I noticed is like the percussion and the guitar have a really like interesting engagement in the song. Like they're really tightly following the same pattern. Yeah, that's what early Nagoya K bands did in general. So that's like, that's all that. Yeah, but I feel like it's also... um sort of like branching a bit with the length of the track like they do some interludes and stuff that wouldn't always be featured in all oh no releases. doubt like you can already tell that and uh there are they are a bit more ambitious and i guess the biggest difference here to, uh, in comparison to Lacedes is that the lead guitar has taken control i mean in this case caro probably Ye- yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's worth mentioning that they s- switched places. Like uh, Dai was the lead guitarist of Las Edis, and in uh, Dear and Grey, it's uh, as people probably know, Kaoru. So I think that probably changed the the dynamic a bit as well of who takes charge of what in the songwriting process. It's one of the songs that I used to have as one of my favorites, but these days it's not one I put on very often. Uh, I don't know why really, it's just not something I, I... If I listen to this album, it's usually one of the later tracks. The second half of the album get, gets most listens from me. Well, I think this song is probably the least original. There's definitely a different idea behind this band than Les Hades, which I will probably get to more later. But they've also improved quite a lot. Like, compare this to anything by Kazari, for example. <laughs> like, it's... The musicianship has improved significantly from the old projects of these guys. Yeah, I mean, listening to Kyo's pre Las Edis bands is very, very rough. You can, it's basically unlistenable a lot of time, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, I think that's about it for this track. I think I really like the sort of like um, dramatic intro as well. It sets the mood for the album pretty well. It's kind of spooky. Yeah, and I think it fits that sort of late 90s gothic, dark VK. Yeah, yeah and it's nice, it's well. unique in their uh, total discography. Uh, yeah, exactly, because I mean, even the next album doesn't have anything like that. That that sort of gothic tinge has been reduced a lot going They forward. never sounded as indie again. <laughs> yeah, for a good reason. They, they never were indie again. <laughs> Fair <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, so the second track is actually one of my least favorite during great songs. Oh, I really, I really like this one actually. Uh, yeah, I fuck with it. I think the reason is that I always thought the intro was very dumb as a kid, and I never really got over that. It's very. Did you say damp? <laughs> like, like the no dumb. Oh, dumb. Okay. You know, stupid. You just meant dank. You just didn't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I meant dank. Yeah, that's that's what I that's what I thought when I was a kid. When I was when I was you were tw- twelve years old. You were already like two thousand fifteen hip lingo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. I actually kind of like the intro. Like, it's just really thumpy drums, and then the guitar kicks in. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I like it too. I mean, the guitars are kind of interesting, I guess. Uh, I think that the structure of the song didn't really appeal to me either. Because of the... It feels a bit repetitive, even though it's short. Well, I think a track like this and Erode, for example, it's just showing a lot of variety already. It's not, again, just a Nagoya blasting. Mm. So... Uh, for some reason, when I was actually listening to this uh, mini album, I was thinking of Pierrot's Pandora no Hako, and it's not because they're like musically really similar, but maybe it's just all the different tempos and maybe also they were at their same point in their careers when it came to sort of developing their own sound. Yeah, or they were just sort of looking in the same direction somewhere. You know, take your pick, which influential early Visual K band you're thinking of. There's something about the guitar in this track that reminded me of Kagura. I don't know what it was exactly, but just like the sound of the riff sounded a bit Kagura-esque to me. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I see that necessarily, but I totally get that. It's it's pretty ahead of its time stuff for 97, I guess. Or maybe it's not ahead of its stuff, yeah. but it certainly aged well, in my opinion. I was going to say that it actually, now that you mention it, it does remind me of some early 2000s stuff, like like Gilly Cadith or something like that has similar riffing oh, in some songs. exactly. There you go. Exactly that vibe. Yeah, I used, when when James said that, I just popped it up in my mind, like some, some early 2000s stuff actually had riffs sounding quite similar to this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then uh, obviously track three is the longest track of the album, Erode. Uh, it's six and a half minutes long. And I guess for me at least that's a song that I never really gave a chance much because it wasn't featured on any lives. And when I was younger I watched a lot of lives mostly, but I don't think it's actually on any proper live releases at all. Which is a shame because it's a very uh, ambitious song. It's a very... It's a song that contains a lot of elements that you would later see more polished in future Deering Grey releases. And you can tell that it's written by a bassist as well, because it has a lot of uh, bass-driven sections. Yeah, there is a lovely part where the guitar picking and the bass is like interplaying, where the main like melodic drive is coming from the bass. It's very nice. And obviously it's progressing throughout. So you got a bunch of different parts and they're trying different things, which is probably the reason why they didn't want to even play it ever afterwards. They probably weren't vibing with the experimentation that much later on. I feel like it could have fit really well into like a Macabre era set list though. Yeah, I'd say so as well. And yeah, and I was just going to say, you almost said prog rock. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of resisted because it's like, not really, but you know, for, oh. you know, Visual K is at the end of the day, kind of formulaic pop music in a way. So <laughs> it's, uh, I'm just, yeah. just thinking about all I'll those. I'll settle for something small. Yeah, I'm sure that if you say it's prog rock, someone will add that to their Wikipedia article that during Grace yeah, exactly. prog rock it's band. Go up there in the tags. <laughs> Next yeah. to black metal and doom metal and yeah, <laughs> synth pop, you know. Uh, so, James, how did you feel about the road? Um, I thought it was all right. I don't have too much to say about this one. I think the guitar was pretty cool. I think there's like two guitar solos in this song, right? And they're both pretty solid. Yeah, yeah that's also uh, f- funny to tell. Yeah, it's it's not something they do very often. Usually, it's one. I guess that's the standard for a track. Yeah, well, it is a pretty long track, though. Yeah. And I suspect that's also a reason why they cut it from their sets, because they could fit, like, two shorter songs in the same amount of time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think so as well. Uh, And track four, I guess we could say, is, like, a fan favorite, without exaggerating. It's uh, Oitsuki, which is 
for which which was at least for a very long time their set list closer for it for concerts they would play like either an extended version or or just like straight up but for the first like four years of their career they would usually end gigs with it who is the girl singing along at the end do you know um, there's like a female a vocalist Shinya. singing <laughs> oh no i have no idea actually oh that kind of uh, surprised I never thought me about i don't that. think i've ever heard that in a during gray track before i don't know if it's in the credits you have the album don't you yeah i have both presses of it uh, in my uh-huh. in my bookshelf I, I i don't know if it's in the credits it, it could very well be uh, I, i'm not the one who would read the uh, credits of a of, a, of an album <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah, so my, I, well, uh, Alex, you could go first for this one, actually. How do you feel about Oh, It's Okay? Yeah, I, I like it. It's sort of middle of the pack for me. I enjoy that they still play live every every once in a while. That's cool. Uh, the extended version is too much for me. I'm not that Yeah, I never got in into the whole like playing the same song over and over for 20 minutes that was very popular back in the day. Wait, really? There's a 20 minute version of this song? Yeah, and it's just them repeating this one set, two sections over and over. <laughs> uh, because, you know, their fans are supposed to interact and like headbang and interact and headbang and stuff. Uh. Uh, the riff is cool though yeah I was going to say that as well that I, I really enjoy the riff and I feel like I have a greater appreciation for the track these days when I've heard more recent live versions because Kyo adds some kind of like oriental flair to the vocals which really fits with a sort of hypnotic style of riffing in this track they played this on the Doom Spiro Sparrow DVD right? uh I am actually not sure if it was the Doom Spero Spero or the Arke. Uh, either way, I'm actually not a fan of either DVD, so uh, <laughs> it doesn't change my point. Yeah, I, I I would say that just watch the Depression off once. Those are the best. That's what you should do in general with late Daring Grey Lives, I think. Those are fantastic. Yeah, yeah you st- and there's one for every album, so you, you, you won't go wrong. Yeah, um, though... How you mentioned that S sounded a little bit like like something like Gilgadith, it sort of puts this track in a different light as well. Now that I think about it, and it's it's nice. It's definitely aged well. Yeah, yeah. Now that you mentioned that as well, it it I I do see some similarities in the riffing to some later bands as well. Uh, certainly bands of three or four years later, which makes sense because as we talked about earlier, like the. Los 80s and early during grade took influences from bands that were maybe four or five years older than them. So mm-hmm. it would make sense to argue that bands from around the turn of the millennium would take influences from during grade. Uh, but yeah, and uh, it's also worth mentioning, mentioning that uh, Aoitsuki had different lyrics on the demo tape, like completely different lyrics. There's not a word that's the same, probably. Oh, interesting. Did it have the same title? Uh, yeah, it did have the exact same title, but the lyrics are completely different. Huh. Barely anything is the same. Uh, and that would become a different great tradition. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, they they do enjoy changing lyrics. They do enjoy changing lyrics. Uh, but yeah, uh, moving on to track five, Garden. This one also reminded me of Kagura. It's possible that I've just listened <laughs> to a lot of Kagura, and that's like my go-to sort of comparison of like early 2000s <laughs> visual. Okay, but I feel like... I don't know, I had some really jangly guitar that's just very Kagura-esque, but I really like this song. Oh. It's one of my favorites on the album, I think. Yeah, I think this was sort of like uh, melodic, generic, Visual K type casting. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. And I think it's, you know, they were aiming for a high energy hit and they certainly did achieve just that, so I, 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 I don't blame them for that. No doubt. I think that kind of stuff was all the rage. Yeah, the and I mean, I, I love this song. I mean, if I'm at a party and Garden comes on, you you best know I will be dancing. <laughs> no, it is a, a fan favorite also. Like, I would say about the Western fandom, but also I think it's... Uh, you know that 
one of the gigs from the Macabre tour that they made a VHS out of. Like, they show it on TV. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's actually fans, like, singing the garden lyrics, kind of expecting the song to come on, <laughs> which surprised me. <laughs> yeah, I think up until that point, they had played garden at all the shows but wait actually i think during that show they actually did play garden and on this yeah, this, this was the 27th of uh, april 2001 unless i'm mistaken uh, at uh, the budokan the tour final for macabre yeah that's right yeah so they did play garden there and i think it mm-hmm. might actually be the last time they ever did so far it's not going to come back. Uh, it will. <laughs> that's the it one will. song. Out of all of them, if I have to bet, that's the one that's not going to come back. I mean, they played Toriko before. I'm, this one. I mean, Jealous came back. <laughs> How do you explain that? Yeah, that's right. That's actually topical for the, uh, yeah. for the episode that it just happened to coincide like this. Yeah. But I have to say, I really, really like Garden. It's one of those... Ah, who doesn't? It's uh, one of those songs that I've been consistently spending growing up and until this day is one of those tracks I will put on quite often. It's just, it's just one of those Visual K tracks that you, you can vibe to in any mood, really. You know, it's perfect indie-level late 90s cheese. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what we love Visual K for. Exactly. At least partially. Yeah. And I would say opposite to that, in a sense, is track six, Bioshin, which is a very aggressive song. See, this is, I think, the most interesting track on this entire mini-album. Why? Because there is this misconception, especially in the Western fandom about Darren Gray, that they changed kind of overnight in the sort of Kiso 6 ugly era. But the thing is, this is already showing signs of having that sort of groom metal influence in it like there's no way that in 97 they haven't heard of something like pantera and i think that's audible it's so different from the old nagoya k influenced thrashing songs where now you got this slower tempo with a moshable riffing there's just no way they didn't know i mean mtv metal was already a big influence of visual k even from kuroyume when they took the arpeggios from slayer season in the abyss for death mask <laughs> so yeah i think that's the biggest difference between deer and gray and les 80s is that the members were listening to metal and i think daring to branch out and actually combine influences just not take influences from one source but rather try to combine different influences as well yeah or at least like because it gives more particular I mean, he was using a band like Anorexia Nervosa on one of the like the UCP DVDs. Yeah. So he did listen to all kinds of stuff as well. Maybe he's more of an aristocratic vampire type, whereas the Deer and Grey Boys obviously loved '90s alternative metal, and that's sort of so. Even from Misa on, I think it was completely natural for them to end up on the Family Values tour. Excuse me. <laughs> Family values tour. That's a very that's a very um, strong prediction to make. You know, you hear Missa once in ninety seven, and you're like, yeah, these guys are going to play with Corn in it's nine dancing. years. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I'm a big fan of this track as well, and it's definitely like you said, one of their most metal songs uh, from this era. You can tell that uh, they were incorporating influences, like we said, and also I think it's a very well composed track in its own right. Like it's a, it's one of their earliest sort of bangers, like the kind of track that you know people will go all out headbanging during a concert for. And um, it was effortlessly remade later on. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those tracks that definitely lends itself well to an update, even though I would say yeah. I prefer this version to the updated one. Uh, I do as well, but there's like no fucking way they would redo S. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they will someday. Maybe they will make some like, you know, Sukekyo-esque weird psychedelic thing out of it. See, that uh, the world is not good enough for that. We just get something that's like the Tsumito Kisei. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's not. What's with the the title? Why is there like a quote in the middle of the two kanji? 
You know what? I I don't know. I, I assumed it was for aesthetic purposes only. You think so? Like S has that too. Uh, S has it around the title and right, it's right. quote it's quotation marks. Uh, the Japanese use uh, those brackets as quotation marks, so it's yeah, just an it just S looks in odd. quotation marks. Yeah, it just looks odd in the middle of two kanji with like nothing quoting. I don't know, but it's a cool aesthetic though. I think you're. I think it's just to look cool. I think it's like what Jigsaw said on a second episode. It's the magic of Visual K. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the, yeah, it's it's the magic of Visual K. You don't know. Wait, you, you have to sing it. it. I'm not to gonna sing, do that. <laughs> sing the magic of Visual K. <laughs> we can play a sample from the second episode. Uh, you should get a sample of him <laughs> singing it. Oh, nice. Uh, it will be the next air horn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, I think that concludes the sort of track by track take on Missa, but how do you guys feel about the album as a whole when you listen to it? Like if you do a listen back to back, how does it how do you feel about it? Is it consistent or Yeah, it's an indie monument already uh showing a lot of ambition. Uh I like unlike the following singles, I like that it doesn't make that strong overtures to mainstream it's i think decisively indie still despite of garden yeah i think it's you can definitely call it a statement in some way because i mean this was recorded and released within less than half a year i think it was released in july unless i'm mistaken and the band formed in february so it was f about five months after they formed and it, you could reasonably think that a lot of the songs were already in their back pocket. Yeah, or at the very least, they had a very intense creative spurt, because I know that already during their earliest lives, they play almost all of these tracks. So they must have been written during that one month period when they set up the band between then and their first live in late uh, March. Yeah, I think it's a pretty solid album. Like I played the whole thing this morning and... There's nothing like I particularly wanted to skip or anything like that. Like it's an enjoyable experience just to listen to the whole thing. Yeah, and it's also compared to what came later, like Alexis said, it's probably like both a statement for where they want to go, but also sort of like a statement on the where they have come from, like the end of the previous era in a way. It catches them when they're growing. Exactly, it's uh, it's in the middle of a transition period. But at the same time, I don't think the growing pains are as awkward as on the following two singles. <laughs> yeah, and with that said, let's uh, move on to the first Dear and Grey single, Jealous. So, what can we say about uh, their first single, Jealous, besides that the photo shoot in the booklet is absolutely amazing? I just wanted to have that <laughs> said for the record. <laughs> go, go ahead. I think we have to talk about that intro, first of all. Yeah. We yeah. Uh, That's talent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the Jealous intro is something that could only happen in Visual K. No, imagine if someone walked into American Idol and just started belting out <laughs> Kukuro wa, ki tsu tsu I, I would hire them. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm actually just fucking like the competition is over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if someone walked into American Idol trying to sing "Jealous" by Darren Gray, I would, I, I would give them the whatever it's golden, golden prize thing right Two away. Two albums and then a spot on like celebrity rehab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, uh yeah although like the song as a whole it's pretty obviously catering to a mainstream audience it should be kept in mind that this is like 98 and this is when excess dahlia was basically brand new uh, and the riff does two, two remind years. me of dahlia just a bit and even the piano in the beginning is very extra pan like yeah which is one I think I have a suspicion that this is why uh, one of the reasons Yoshki scouted them because he felt that Jealous had some similar sensibilities to himself later on. Uh, yeah, it's an epic track. Um, it's rough, but it's as epic as they could do at the time. And I think it's the only attempt in their early early discography, at least, of trying to make an almost speed metal esque riff. Uh, yeah, or ever, like uh, at least in this. Uh, this is the most eighties poodle rock. Yeah, thing you that could. They would ever uh, do. Yeah, I mean, they they have some some speed metal esque riffs going on later as well in tracks like Barry, for example. But uh, even then, it's more quirky, so I think it's not comparable in that way. No, I think it's completely different context. This with the sensitive melodic intro going into this rocking worst and then all of it climaxes in the chorus it's first of all very x like and second just sheer 80s <laughs> and the intro and the chorus are the same as well which is interesting yeah uh, yeah so james how did you feel about the track jealous besides it being very long <laughs> it is really long. it's almost seven minutes huh yeah, I, I notice this sometimes when I play it at the club. Like it, it kind, it kind of drags sometimes, especially you know the intro. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's my complaint with it. It's a bit long, and I mean, that intro is something else. But I mean, I don't know. It's it's charismatic. I I dig it. I like the song overall. I think it's good. Oh yeah. No, I, this is still like pure visual gate cheese. Like I got my lighter on for the whole seven minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I I. I, I can't be too critical of this song. It's one of my all-time favorites, and you know, it's the energy it has once the in intro goes away is, is pretty phenomenal. <laughs> like it, it, it can really, it can really lighten up your mood. Like if you need some extra energy for something, just put that on loud, and then yeah. you're good to go. Yeah. Well, speaking of no energy, how about the jealous reverse? <laughs> oh yeah, the the piano. Uh, how do you say piano remake of the track piano version yeah uh, that they bust out for lives every once in a while yeah so. i'm i'm not a huge fan of it i mean i oh, me neither. i appreciate it for what it is but it doesn't really go anywhere and it doesn't really give me anything in comparison to ballads from the same era yeah i mean some people go crazy for it but give me that fucking synth and shredding baby <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh it's it's de it's definitely uh, you can tell that they have developed a bit coming off Misa with this, and I mean it's fair because it's been half a year almost between their releases. Yeah, I think this is them sort of like the, this is the reason why they broke up with Kisaki. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, they proposed this in a meeting, and he was like, "I'm not gonna have it." <laughs> yeah, and then probably, yeah. maybe, possibly in the same meeting, "Unknown Despair: A Lost" came out, uh, which at least in this household, is probably more famous for the rather unfortunate lift from Lunacy's G. Uh, yeah, that's uh, actually something I was going to bring up as well. The B-side B is one of my favorite tracks, but it's uh, he heavily influenced, let's say, by the song G by <laughs> Lunacy. Inspired by. Yes, heavily inspired by G by Lunacy. I'm going to have to listen again because I wrote down I didn't really like it and I kind of already forget what it sounds like. Uh, it sounds like Lunas is G. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the, yeah, the it's almost as if like autism era Kyoharu covered Lunas is G, and that's actually pretty nice. I like the panning from left to right. Yeah, 
it's yeah. it's definitely I would say an improvement on the Luna C track, but that's you know that's something. Oh, I wouldn't go that far, uh, but pe- pe- it, pe- it stands alone. Yeah, I think very well. Yeah, I mean, if I compare them side to side, I prefer the Deer and Gray song to, than the Luna C song. But obviously, I'm biased because you know Deer and Gray is my favorite band. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't, and also, but, I, I don't think it's one of Luna C's best songs either. I think they have plenty oh, better no. songs. No, definitely not. Actually, I don't like the rock and roll Luna C. Yeah, I, I prefer the early as visual. as much as the early stuff. Yeah, but I think before we move on to the next single, it's probably safe to say that with the single, they were really positioning themselves like in the visual rock market. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh and I think it's worth mentioning also that around this time re- they released that uh, first VHS tape with the PVs, the the Kaede if trans, if trans uh, VHS <laughs> that has uh, the Karma and uh, Sangeki no Yoru and those. It has ash on it. Uh, yes, it does have ash on it. Uh, ash. Was I think that's. Probably the main appeal of that thing. Ash, the original one, is a very nice song. Uh, yeah. I mean, the original was on the VA Behind the Mask back in 97. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, then right. the second version, which is just a straight up re recording of it, uh, is on this uh, VHS tape, along with a re recording of Karma as well, which isn't released on any CDs either. So you, it's, I also like that one. Yeah, so it's kind of worth getting a, like an audio version of it if you can just to have, have those songs. And yeah, and I guess we, we will now move on to their final, <clears throat> their final Indies release, their second single. Out of all of their indie songs, I can't help but feel like this is the one the band dislikes the most themselves. Because it's uh, one of their least played songs in concert, and I never hear them speak about it or say anything good about it either. I mean, if you're talking about like Visual Gay Fluff before, this is the definition of the term. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I can see that. The intro is super nostalgic, though. I don't know if it's just because, like, it's nostalgic to me because it was one of the first songs I think I heard by them, but it's just, like, it has that really nostalgic vibe to it. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I love I think the despite intro. the criticism, I have to reiterate that all these songs are certified bangers. Oh, definitely. Like, uh, I, I I mean, we I really have to, you know, dig deep in my heart to find something bad to say about these songs. Uh, yeah. Because, because, I mean, I'm a huge fan of all of them. But honestly, now going back to all these releases after such a long time and trying to think of them in like the context of Visual K at the time, it's a pretty shameless sort of, well, would you call it selling out? Maybe, maybe not, but it's kind of definitely up there. This is kind of the romance of Scarlet to their Nagikarabo if neither was as good as they are, (laughs) I guess. (laughs) I mean, I I kind of get that in a way. And also I think that they were actively hunting for a major contract at this time. Like Mesa was sort of like a statement to put out to, you know, be able to play lives and stuff and build a reputation in the scene. And then Jealous and Isle was, you know, their attempt at attracting major label attention. Yeah, it's interesting that they tried so hard and then they would try so hard rejecting it later. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, they have stayed major ever since. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I guess uh, they really cynically did just try to get big. And I mean, fuck it, it did work for them. Um, yeah, no surprise, this kind of melodic lead guitar work was 
as I said, all the rage at the time. All the original Nagoya K bands had already moved on to stuff like this. You got like Mask from Fanatic Crisis, Kagero by Laputa, and Bible by Rouage. So they were all getting progressively more melodic. And even Kisaki with his next band, Mirage, would do melodic guitar work instead of the old, darker Nagoya style. Yeah, and I think that this song, despite being melodic, does have a very high energy to it. Like it's, um, it's definitely not a snooze like some of Kisaki's melodic songs can be. It's 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 a song that has a good drive to it. It's also worth mentioning that this song was uh, produced by um, the guitarist of Desire, uh, like oh. D equals Sire. Desire. Yeah, yeah. that's a good band, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it was produced by their guitarist Kiyoshi. So I wonder if he had... Uh, actually, it was produced and arranged by him. It's written by Darren Gray, but arranged by him. So I wonder if he had any input in the creative process. Uh, could be. Although to yeah. me, it does still sound like it's the same band that made Jealous. Although the sort of the more hair metallier aspects are missing. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's a toned down song in comparison for sure. And... Uh, and I would say that the B-side might be one of their most forgettable tracks. A lot of people forget that Toriko even exists. <laughs> I agree with that. I kind of, I already forget what it is. I, yeah, I don't know. I wasn't super into the B-sides on either of these singles. And I think that was one of the most forgettable ones for me. I can't really think of what it sounds like right now. <laughs> Can I ask, what the fuck is the drum outro? Oh yeah, uh, I it's do so remember weird. That. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I think the song was actually written by Shinya, unless I'm mistaken. So maybe he just like f- went like nuts in the studio. <laughs> so like a fucking middle school drummer. He's like, yeah. let yeah. me put all my shit in. Like I want every single yeah. feel that I know to be in the song. <laughs> maybe he was like, okay, so maybe the some ma- major label executive is listening. I will just play everything I know how to do. <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, it's it's not a terrible song, but it's very forgettable. So forgettable that I would say that even hardcore Deering Grey fans often forget it exists. Uh, I've played this at uh, quiz events with really hardcore Visual K fans, and they have not been able to tell what song it was. A lot of people guessed it was Lacedes. I have been one of those people who, upon hearing this song, couldn't remember what it was. <laughs> exactly. So I think it's safe to say it's uh, it's one of those songs that they are probably not going to bring back anytime soon. Uh, but yeah, and I mean around this time, I suppose they actually did sign a major contract, and because they had their last indies live around uh, November, I believe, of ninety eight. So only a few months after the release of Isle, which was in August. Uh, so they, I mean, they, they definitely worked their strategy, you know, they wanted to go major, they did two singles and they got a contract, so, I mean, you can't fault them for that. Should we talk about their uh, last Indies live at the Budokan? Yeah, just quickly, briefly. So they were going to release that last Indies live as a live VHS, but the band was so ashamed of their performance, they refused to release it. Uh, I get it. To be honest, <laughs> it's not that good. I watched the entire thing a few times in the past week, and there's some moments where it's just extremely awkward. Yeah, you can uh, you can tell was, they. No, I was just gonna say you can tell that they were definitely not used to playing on a huge arena stage like that. They didn't know yeah, what to do Kyo's, with themselves. Kyo's visual K dancing trope on a big stage doesn't work at all. <laughs> there is a. When they play Jealous, he's in the background just vibing while they're playing the solo. And if it's not weird enough, th- <laughs> they actually fuck up the solo and he's just <laughs> dancing <laughs> in, in like the shadow in the back. It's so bad. Um, yeah, because I think all of their moves were, you know, made up for like tiny club venues and stuff like that. Yeah, it's just like, you know, how Visual K bands do when they're playing in a broom closet and works for that crowd. <laughs> But when you're doing like a big stage, you've got to move around and the camera is like flying across the venue. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. And also like they do fuck up a few parts. Yeah. Uh, and as like performers, even though doing just like a podcast, I understand like it really does come down to the details. 
So as a performer, I'm sure you get irritated even from just fumbling like one line or when you just repeat a phrase over and over. So I totally get that even with a few fuck ups, they were looking at this footage and they were like, nope. <laughs> yeah, which is a shame because it would have been a very interesting historical document, you know, to have a full uh, professionally filmed uh, live from this era. Oh, naturally, like I don't give a shit what they think about it. I just want to have it. It also <laughs> has the novelty of having a video footage of Torico and the early version of Fries on Tetra, which is nice. Yeah, because, you know, uh, it's worth mentioning that the, the video footage that exists are uh, only partial and it's only from one camera. I think it was uh, leaked from one of the people who were hired to film at the concert. He leaked his portion, which is why it's only 40 minutes. And it's also filming the audience for half of that time. Which is actually kind of interesting, seeing like this mix of school children and cosplayers. <laughs> yeah, the Visual K audiences in the 90s looked very interesting. Yeah, that's when people actually listen to this music. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, and from there, we we don't really have much more anything to add. I mean, they did their last Indies Lives, and uh, then in early 1999, they had their major debut with Yoshki for three singles released on the same day as their major debut, but we will discuss that in the next episode, which, which will go over the year 1999. I have one final thing. They also released a kind of like a history video going over some yeah, early right, concerts. Yeah. And one thing that I noticed going through it is that there is a th part where Kyo is on a podium. That is until I was corrected on Twitter that is in fact not a podium, but it is a lectern. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, oh, so yeah. it's You got called out for that on Twitter. I Someone did. Someone corrected you. There was like a podium account. That just corrects and there people was, when they get podiums wrong and tells them that they're lecterns. There was maybe a good 30 minutes when I considered just deleting the entire Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the best tweet, though. So many people have it loved did, it. It's the most successful tweet that we've had. It did give us huge exposure. So I thank you, lectern man. <laughs> yeah, sh sh shout out to the lectern man. Thank you for uh, wrapping the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, Without further ado, let's move on to the new section, which is the latest single. So this single, uh, Oboro, is brand new. It was released today, so I guess we have very fresh impressions on it. How do you guys feel about it so far? It's super ominous, especially the intro. It's just like that thumpy John Carpenter style synth with the piano. It just reminds me of like... A soundtrack to a zombie movie or something <laughs> you know what it reminds me of ranunculus uh, yeah uh, which is another dear and gray song that was released a few years ago it's quite similar is it like recycled i don't know that song uh it's, it's not exactly recycled but no. it considering that this comes hot on the heels of that song they are kind of similar not in a similar that they like repeated themselves per se but structure wise sort of the yeah that's kind of repeated. But I, I would say this one has more, though. Like, you have the the strings and the, some electronics and keys as well. Oh, no doubt. Like, I'm a fan of the song. And I'm kind of now, like, cautiously optimistic about the next album. It's a bit formulaic, again, but that's sort of the singles format, except for the World of Mercy, where it's, like, approximately four minutes, verse, chorus you know, verse, bridge, whatever. But just hearing that little bit of violin made all the difference to me personally, especially because it kind of brings to mind Hotarubi. Mm. I, I, I do wish this song was longer, though. I feel like there was opportunities they could have done more with it than they did. They, yeah, they, absolutely. It, it feels a bit rushed. They could have easily added another minute without hurting it at all. Oh, I could have taken like seven minutes of this easily, especially there's like one transition around like the Mark II 48 or something that's like <laughs> that's so specific. jarring and so abrupt that when I first heard the edit, I thought that's going to be the part where they actually add something. But no, they just added like a solo like before that. So I was a little surprised, but... Yeah, I enjoyed how the violin sort of fades into a guitar solo as well. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's like you said, it's... Uh... 
it's a bit formulaic, but it's also, you know, the way it's singles work. A sides have to be easy to understand and easy to digest. And for that, I think it's doing a great job. I mean, at least if you're on Dynamite Tommy's label, that's how it's going to be. <laughs> Except <laughs> yeah. for World of Mercy, I guess. So technically, it seems like they can do whatever they want. But hey, I think we're just maybe a little bit spoiled as far as Dear Grey goes. That when they release something that's sort of, let's say sort of usual for them. We we're like, yeah. oh, you know, it's just Deer and Grey doing Deer and Grey. If this was a new band, it would be... I, I would just say that I would probably use a few more superlatives in describing it. Yeah, definitely. So it's a, it's a gorgeous song, like, you know, yeah. melodies, whatever. And, and it feels like a song that will grow on you. Uh, I, oh, I've only yeah. heard it, like, three or four times so far in its full version, so my impressions are quite um, quite early and quite fresh. So I feel like it will be interesting to know how I feel about the song in a week or two. Yeah, and I think Kyo also does a marvelous job, not only just in the song itself, but also in the music video. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. James, did you see the music video? <laughs> no, what's it like? Describe uh, it for me. Uh, so Kyo is being born <laughs> out of this <laughs> gigantic <laughs> stomach-like appendage which is tied to one of the ladies from the Obscure PV. And uh, blood is spat out. Um, they kind of cuddle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's kind I of sensitive but weird. It <laughs> yeah, it's, it's I, definitely... I give it a full endorsement. <laughs> it's definitely worth watching. It's a, uh, it's, it's a very visual uh, PV for sure. Yeah. Sounds it's so like nice it. to have like good PVs from this band again. They had a period when they just made really shitty music videos. And that was <laughs> yeah, really remember like, like Dosing Green or something when they just played in a studio with some fire? Oh, see, that one I thought was all right, but like, <laughs> uh, let me think for a second, which was like the pit. Well, I didn't like Ochita either that much. Well, we didn't see the full one though. But anyway, like Ranunculus yeah. was a really nice PV. Mm. And so is this one. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, they have certainly sort of in, increase their focus on the visual aspects of things again. Uh, and yeah, and speaking about visual, uh, the B-side is a remake of an old song, The Domestic Fucker Family. Oh shit, now we got R-rated again, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how did you guys feel about the remake? Uh, I'm not sure, James, have you ever heard the original track? Uh, it's from their Kiso album from 2001. Yes, I did. And I didn't notice it was a remake at first because the title is just TDFF. And like as yeah. I was listening to it, I was like, wait, I think I know this. Um, it's good. It's loud. Kyo does the growling thing where I'm not sure if he's saying like full words or not, but it sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really enjoy it because I feel like it's a, it's an update. Like the additions are just enough to make it distinct, but not too different. It's like it's on that f fine line where you can still hear it's the same song, but you can appreciate the additions they made, like a bass solo, for example. Because the original song for me is quite boring on CD. I feel like it's kind of dragging and tedious and monotone. But it's great. It was great live. But now I feel like the CD version too has been spiced up in a way that makes it feel not boring at all. And the ferociousness from the remake they did uh, of the deeper violence is very similar to this one, I feel. Yeah, I fuck with all the changes that they made. The only problem is that there's two things which I cannot stand. Uh, number one is the guitar tone. I think it's awful. Um, and the second one is the vocal filter, which Q has been using for the remake since like the Vestiges remakes, which I don't understand. Um, but otherwise, I think it's a very nice remake of a song that, just like you said, on CD isn't anything much. I like it on the context of Kizo, but I don't think there's a time when I listen to it just by itself. The live version is cool. Yeah. Yeah, I love the live version from the Depression uh, DVDs and also the ones I was fortunate enough to attend in person. There's also the... A bit where they're playing it in Shanghai, I think, in like 2000 <laughs> something? Two, I believe. 
Yeah, 2002. Yeah, uh, the very <laughs> cold uh, recording quality adds to the song. That's how I prefer my Kizo, is as raw as possible. Yeah, uh, so overall I think it's a, a nice addition to the remix uh, catalog they have going. It's certainly not one of the worst. I would rate it uh, somewhere around the top. It's not the best remake they made, but it's certainly up there with like... It's one of those I feel like it's not offensive that they have done a remake. Yeah, I think the last one, uh, Clever's Lizard remake, was completely pointless. It almost sounds like the, exactly the same song, just with... Uh, a lot of production choices which i don't agree with uh yeah. yeah they emphasized the right things in this one yeah and i mean the the third track is just a live track so i don't think we need to go into depth about that but i just want to mention that the production value and the sound quality on that is so much better than the actual studio recorded songs oh, fuck yeah like <laughs> Like the the instrument separation and the sort of like uh, air, every instrument can breathe in the mix and everything. It's it's so much better. I wish they could use the same person mixing the live track as for the studio tracks. Yeah, I don't know how we got to that point that they sound better live than they sound on CD. And it's just because of like really strange production choices that I've never seen anyone like. Is there a person who likes the production on Insulated World? If there is, I haven't met them. <laughs> By the way, uh, there was a recent Kyo interview uh, where he's asked about the live track, and he was like, oh yeah, I didn't even listen to it. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice. Yeah, I don't think they listen to their own live tracks. Um, but yeah, I think those were our impressions of the new single. We might have something to add in the next episode if we feel like we have missed something and that we feel like this, we'd hate the song now or something like that. But for now, I think this was our impressions of the new Dear and Grace single, Oboro. Hey, Alexi, what's this thing I've been hearing about called Rare's Hut? Rare's Hut.net is the one-stop shop destination for all your things Visual K. Can I get Dear and Gray there? Most likely. But if not, you can get a bunch of other very, very cool stuff. Like recently, I saw that they had the first Malicent single, which is fantastic. I've seen Pierrot's The Final album for like seven bucks, which is crazy. If I had any money on my person, I would get it immediately. <laughs> but yeah, so so I, I mean, it's it's definitely the place to go if you, if you need any Visual K on the cheap. Yeah, I think we have to emphasize that it's not just the same old boring Euro presses that everyone is trying to sell for 30 bucks on Facebook. It's actually like straight up really nice stuff from Japan. Like, for example, the Malisan single that you might have missed on at the time. And then you don't want to pay for importing fees from Japan, but you can get it from rarezot.net. Yeah, we highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. Uh, and... Uh... Oh, we have to plug uh, Alexis' new uh, Twitter account. Uh, well, the, our Twitter account that he's now in charge yeah, of. Yeah, please follow the Visual K podcast on Twitter, where I try my best to be a social media influencer with mixed results. <laughs> it's the the VK podcast, That's I right. think. Yeah, at the VK podcast on Twitter. Uh, so yeah, please follow Alexi on Twitter and reply to all his tweets and... If he ever mistakes a lectern for a podium again, please call him out on that. <laughs> and please, I beg you, anything that I say wrong on a podcast, correct me there also. It will just mean more interaction. It's good for the show. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for listening to this episode of the Visual K podcast. This episode should be out on the 2nd of May, and uh, the next episode should be out on the 16th two weeks later look if you want more of your friends to be individual k we are happy to help with that so please recommend us to your friends and uh consider giving us a five-star rating and subscribe also why not right anyway uh catch new episodes on apple podcasts uh spotify youtube i wrote youtube in my notes uh and all other places thanks bye wait say it sayonara <laughs>